unconditional love, devotion until the end of time, entity number 59, Philia, image caption, a self-portrait of Philia, description, Philia is a humanoid being resembling a pale-skinned woman with long wavy pink hair, light pink eyes, and unconventional clothing and accessories. She is often seen wearing a long white dress with a golden rope tied around the waist, golden bracelets around her wrists, and a golden necklace with a pink jewel in the middle. At the center of her dress is a large heart-shaped jewel. She has been spotted with a white veil, crown of pink roses, or golden headpiece resembling a pair of wings adorning her head. Philia possesses a large pair of wings, allowing her to fly at high speeds, which she can manifest and dematerialize at will. She carries a large pink staff with her at all times, which can be turned into a bow with a set of arrows. However, she claims to rarely use these weapons. Her presence in an area can easily be indicated by a sweet aroma of flowers and sweets, and a sudden sensation of peace being spread around all those present in the room with her. Biology Philia uses she-her pronouns. She also presents as female, though her gender is not biologically determined in the same way as a human's, due to her nature. Note, see phenomenon number 10. Unlike humans, she claims to have no need for nourishment to survive. She lacks internal organs and cannot bleed, instead releasing a substance resembling a pink mist when hurt, theorized to be a condensed form of life force energy. Furthermore, Philia claims that the rest of her body is capable of rapidly regenerating with the ability to replace any dead, sick, or missing part with ease. As such, most damage done to her never lasts long, and she can even remove and recreate any part of her body at will. Her healing powers, which she refers to as restoration abilities, have a negentropic effect on matter, allowing her to heal any wounds, regrow limbs, revert developing illnesses, and even repair broken objects. Philia has a soothing effect which manifests through an aura around her that she can control at will turning most hostile beings around her docile and amicable. Her charming abilities are correlated to her connection with quote-unquote love, as she described. She has the ability to convince someone to follow her instructions, but she only ever uses it in emergency situations, seeming to dislike using them at all. Lastly, Philia is able to summon pink heart-shaped energy shields, which are resistant against a relatively high amount of force. She can also use her arrows to momentarily freeze and pacify those around her, though they cause no pain or injury when piercing a target. Discovery Philia has allegedly existed ever since ancient human beings inhabited the back rooms, and perhaps even earlier. There have been numerous references to her in the past, through scriptures, illustrations, murals, and even some written documents or poems, dating as far back as several centuries ago. These recordings have been well preserved by the Lost, who claim that she was once worshipped as a goddess in their pantheon. In the religion of the Lost, Philia has been described as the goddess of love, who coexisted alongside her companions for centuries before the rumored downfall of the gods separated them all after which all formal worship of Philia ceased. As with other beings speculated to have a link to the Lost's pantheon, it is theorized that the ancient human inhabitants of the backrooms perceived Philia as a goddess due to the level of power she possessed, and their inability to attribute it to anything other than a quote-unquote divine nature. Philia has never confirmed or denied such claims. The Lost has created an article that was written with information gathered over the years by their ancestors, which describes Philia as a being through the lens of the religious perspective of the time. It is stored in the Lost Archival and will be linked below. Lost Legends Archival Initiative Philia 
goddess of love, motherhood, and beauty, member of the Pantheon. Image caption, an ancient painting of Philia, titled Delicate Love. Status, alive. Abode, unknown. Animal, dove, swan, lovebird. Flower, rose, tulip, carnation. Level, gardens of bliss. Personal information, parents, none, first generation, relations, all of the pantheon gods, friends, Fingari, presumed partner, champions, none. Description, Philia was one of the goddesses of our ancient pantheon. Legends portray her as kind, loving, and helpful. Furthermore, some even describe her as playful and flirtatious, though motherly and compassionate. She was most known to help those who were soulmates fall in love, to help those who were unfortunate by giving them a new chance at life, and to help those who were sickly and injured by healing them with her miraculous powers. She was greatly adored by our ancient brothers, inspiring various artworks and monuments. Hufstad, note, sea level 51, and other ancient settlements were once home to various temples dedicated to her and her followers. Most monuments and traditions related to Philia have been preserved over the centuries. In fact, there has been a recent resurgence in interest in our ancient traditions among the newer generations, leading to a minor revival in the celebration of festivities. Appearance in Texts Philia has appeared in many poems, scriptures, and texts over the course of history. She was the protagonist of a long set of manuscripts titled Love, Passion, and Gentleness, which mused about the concept and meaning of love. She also appeared in one of the longest stories of its time, titled The Fair Divine Lady. In it, she was depicted as a goddess in disguise that assisted a woman known as Penelope to find her one true love. She has appeared in other minor poems and stories as well, which have unfortunately only been recovered in broken fragments or were completely lost to time. Physical Description Philia may assume a variety of forms, primarily depending on the preferences of those around her. She most commonly manifests as a tall, pale, feminine humanoid figure with wavy pink hair, pink eyes, a long, flowing white or pink dress, and golden or pink accessories. She is also often, though not always, depicted with large angelic wings and a bright, thin halo above her head, adorned with flowers or a veil. Most representations of her in art or scripture seem to vary depending on the creator's own preferences. Worship. The main temple dedicated to Philia was known as Amoria. It was a fairly large structure, constructed in marble, and inhabited by several statues and neatly decorated pillars. At the center was an altar for offerings and gifts to the goddess. Since Philia was known to be against any act of violence, her followers would never commit animal sacrifices, instead offering objects symbolically related to her. First, worshippers would gather a clean basket, in which they would place various roses, carnations, and tulips. They would place pearls across the flowers, followed by three feathers taken from the goddess's associated animals. Lastly, they would place the basket underneath the altar and recite a short prayer. This ritual was done with the purpose of attracting luck and love and peace in life, or to wish for the health of someone in need, but also to express gratitude to the goddess for her good deeds. Other than rituals, many festivals were held in her honor. One in particular, known as the Grateful Feast, was hosted to celebrate friendship and harmony. Our ancestors would organize great banquets for everyone to join in and eat even the less fortunate, in honor of the kindness that was symbolic of the goddess. All sacred animals to Philia were treated with utmost respect, as it was common belief that doing so would grant a blessing from her. It was also common to bring these animals to weddings as a good omen. 
symbols. Philia had several objects, animals, and plants that were associated with her. Doves for being symbols of marriage and peace. Lovebirds for being symbols of eternal union and innocence. Roses, tulips, and carnations for being all flowers related to gentle or passionate love. Pearls and quartzes for being symbols of beauty. Pomegranates and strawberries for also symbolizing marriage or a love confession. Relationship with others. Humans. The goddess was always described to love human beings very much. She was known to find human beings as curious beings who are intriguing and adorable. As a result, she always tried to spend as much time as possible near them. Despite the gradual fallout between humans and gods, Philia seems to have never been truly forgotten about or seen in a bad light by our ancestors. To this day, there are still those amongst us who worship her existence and wish for her proper return. Philia was also known to have had the closest relationship with certain humans, indicating that she saw them as equals. She was never said to have treated them any differently than she would her fellow gods. Gods. Fingare. Link to related tale. The back rooms. You've been here before. Fingare, god of thoughts. Fingare, avatar of thoughts. Image caption. No image caption available. Since the day I was created, I was told one singular thing. Maintain the balance at any cost. Do not lose your greatness. In my first years of existence, I did not grasp this concept to its fullest. I was young and naive. I had no understanding of emotions, or what others could normally feel. And yet, I felt no need to experience them anyway. If one were to raise a bird without wings, it would have no wish for flight. Such was how I progressed through my existence. Yet deep down, I always knew that there was something that differentiated me from my peers. The more the years passed, the more I understood. From my friends, I came to learn of feelings such as laughter and sadness. I could understand them, but not feel them. Despite it being so close in reach, I was not ready to take this big step, to be like them. Until I met her, the beginning of everything. She found me alone underneath a tree and sat by my side, reading the papyrus script I held with glee. It was one of my written poems, and she complimented it, praising my skills. She asked me to write more, and so I did, and after each poem came a sweet smile and a soft compliment. She lightly placed her hand on top of mine and told me, You will be a great writer one day. I felt her delicate skin against my repulsive body, and for the first time, I felt my heart beat. Heart filled my face, and light filled my eyes. I felt emotions, and I took that step to finality, willing to feel love. After she came into my life, there was never a moment where I wanted to be alone. She awakened unknown feelings within me. I flew after her like a bird who had just discovered flight and she awaited me for each step. Soon, I learned many other emotions. I began searching for what was new, craving what I, I had been deprived of since creation. Friendship, playfulness, and curiosity. I often got lost in her pink eyes, which made my stomach tie in knots. Her singing voice, which inspired me to write so many things, and her laughter, which filled me with joy. Her laughter was all I wanted to hear. Mine was not so beautiful, yet she would always insist otherwise. She never saw me as an empty and pitiful being, nor did the rest in our circle. I got lost in this new, blissful life, wishing that I could keep this happiness close to my heart. How foolish I was. Though I was foolish to have believed that I had any choice to embrace that which I had been denied to have thought that I could have led a peaceful existence in control of myself. I was foolish to have thought that we could start a family together, that I could take care of my son and watch him grow up, the child that never got to form until centuries later. Figue. 
Everything fell apart, and now I am but a mere husk. I discovered that the thoughts belonging to others in my mind were becoming corrupted and strange. I did not understand what could cause such an imbalance. Not until the day I awoke from the false dream I crafted for myself, when the true insanity of my creator revealed itself. She had seen that terrible side of me, the side my creator forces upon me as an avatar of thought. They made me hurt her, controlled my body, like it wasn't my own. When she pressed her lips on mine for the last time in our union as soulmates, I felt excruciating agony. It was my punishment for all those years of mistakes. The thoughts began erratically traveling my mind, and I fled and hid. Imbalance was caused because of me, because I dared to live. That is when they came to me, with their piercing gaze and otherworldly form, scolding me for being such a fool, a fool that was built to feel nothing so that no thoughts would get affected by feelings and irrationality. I was a tool, as I was told, without any form of hyperbole. I could not love, I could not cry, and I could not be happy, for such things would so disorder and imbalance. It would cause suffering for everyone, with erratic and incomprehensible thoughts. My life ended that day because I do not consider myself alive any longer. No living being can endure centuries of nothingness and torture, forcefully stripped of an identity. I became a sculpture molded to the desires of its crafting hand, no matter how much I refused and attempted to flee this fate. She suffered, and I couldn't be there for her. I was trapped and kept like a puppet. Our love that lasted for so long could not continue like this, not when my puppeteer punished me by making me harm her in a frenzy. I let go of her, of the product of our love, of those I cared for, and I became a hollow shell without any reason to fight. I endured the consequences of my first attempts at rebelling, painful torture and punishment. I cannot die, and I cannot run because no matter what, I shall be forced to resume my duty once again. If I were to endlessly sleep, then I would never have to suffer again. Every bit of my personality was burned off, my heart torn out and put on display as a sign of weakness and impurity. I drowned my sorrows in nectar, so much that I wished for it to replace my ichor and purge my mind of thoughts in the spiral of drunken bliss. But no matter how much I drank, the pain would never leave me. Every time one of my friends would try to help me, I would come close to giving in and accepting it, only to be painfully punished and forced to harm them. I could not bear it anymore, and so I hid. I hid in this forest temple where nobody will come, and so yet another prison for me was made. Not even the blissful endless sleep could save me, because then another would replace me and I could never let someone suffer as I did. No matter what plan I devise, there is no exit, because whatever I will do, they will find a way to instill fear and guilt into me, and it will continue endlessly. My soulmate, I will never be able to give her a peaceful life. I will never be able to be with my friends the same way as before. And so I let them go, for the sake of easing their pain and giving them a chance to live a peaceful life without this abomination, without suffering, because of my inability to escape. The story will continue, no matter if I hide or not. The fate of a god always ends in sorrow, and I remain in this silent room. For the sake of the multiverse, for the sake of existence, true balance shall be achieved. This is the will of Adaru, the great mind, impurity shall be eradicated. The back rooms, you've been here before. Fingari, god of thoughts. There was once a naive pesky bird who wished to fly outside its cage, unaware of what dangers the outside posed. The bird was stubborn and did not listen, and so it forced itself through the cage bars. The bird fell, breaking its little legs. 
The bird was foolish to go against what it was told, because those who spoke knew what was best for the bird. The bird exists to sing and stay put, so that its song may maintain peace. It is selfish to neglect such duty. Great sacrifices must be made for the sake of the greater good, even if the little bird must remain caged for such purposes. Only those who achieve purity may truly understand the meaning of sacrifice. Even when its wings are clipped, the bird will still relentlessly attempt to fly away. Only once it loses all reason to go outside, then the bird will sing, for it has nothing else to cling to other than its own voice. A lovely philosophy, is it not? Fear is the only means of assuring no harm, for fearless individuals will do as they please and cause disaster, just like the vermin which dare defy gods. How disgusting. Oh, but if you have gotten this far, you have great determination to decipher my word, do you not? I am Adru, the great mind, and the order of things shall be maintained for as long as I exist. Your thoughts, your desires, only function correctly because of I and all my work. Mortals like you are such precious little pawns on this chessboard. If they are moved too far beyond their designated spaces, bad things happen. You understand this, don't you? I'm only doing what is requested of me to keep everything safe. I was once a fool, too. Do not let your curiosity distract you from your purpose. If you have a responsibility, you must fulfill it without question. Only then shall you be free from the fear of mistakes or a crushing catastrophe. That is the will of fate. You would not wish to be like the foolish bird, would you? To be put back into place through punishment. Continue your search for true purpose, the one bestowed upon you from birth and I shall remain watching, listening. I hear what others believe to be secrets. I see you, always, no matter where you are. Praise be Adru, the great mind. Look into my light. No image caption available. Return to the Lost Legends article on Philia. Fingare was recognized as Philia's husband and devoted admirer. Their relationship was seen as a healthy and admirable one, and many aspired to it and saw it as a model to follow. Devoted followers of Fingarai would write poems dedicated to Philia as a tradition, to represent the deep love the god showed to her. In return, Philia would bless followers of Fingarai with great affection and long-lasting good health. After a certain point in time following the ancient wars, Fingarai began disappearing from all forms of depictions, ceasing to be seen by Philia's side and having been forgotten by most. To this day, Philia and Fingarai still have not been seen or depicted together ever since. Nunca Nunca was considered to be Philia's adopted son, with manuscripts claiming that she helped raise him when he was just a young orphan. She was shown to deeply care for him and adore him dearly, often taking part in his exhibitions and trickery to support him. Unfortunately, after Nunca's passing, it was rumored that she suffered from a great grief that lasted for various centuries, and possibly up until present time. Allseer The Allseer was said to be one of the goddess's closest friends. It was said that Philia possessed a certain piece of knowledge from the Allseer that nobody else had, but was sworn to secrecy. Following the Allseer's death, Philia was said to be overwhelmed by guilt for being unable to prevent what had supposedly been revealed to her. Gudang. Philia referred to Gudang. Note, see the enigmatic entity Nostalgi Gaius. As a dear friend, and often served as a muse and model for Gudang's paintings and sculptures. She also tried to always accommodate her needs and wishes, trying to appease her in every way possible. After her disappearance, Philia began practicing painting and sculpting in her honor. The Sisters Three Philia was one of the few gods who could properly spend time with all three sisters properly. 
Note, see the article on Entity 194, Even the Angry Killian and the Despondent Ita, legends say that she used to often visit them to help them deal with their struggles and try to make them happy, which made them all trust her dearly and significantly helped them improve their mental health. Once they died, she kept a gem resembling each sister as an object of mourning. Gatekeeper Perhaps one of the gods that Philia cherished the most. Philia had a special and playful relationship with the gatekeeper. Note, see Entity 103. She was often described to enjoy his knowledgeable and wise nature. Our ancestors claimed that they were often together, and that gatekeeper would accompany Philia all over this reality and support her grand plans and hobbies. Gatekeeper's assassination crushed the goddess's heart, and she never truly moved on from it. Modern Day Philia reportedly still lives in the present day. She is known to be a well-liked and popular entity, though most remain unaware of her connection to our religion and culture. She still continues her mission to assist human beings and take care of them, having not changed her behavior despite the passage of time. She often avoids questions about her past, perhaps out of grief or fear of the return of the Iron Fist. Return to Original Article Behaviors Philia has been described as an amicable, kind, and selfless person. She has reportedly helped thousands of people over the course of her existence through acts such as using her healing abilities to treat injured wanderers, assisting groups in gathering supplies, or providing the Meg an opportunity to study hostile entities up close by pacifying them. Philia is also friendly towards entities. In fact, they seem to rapidly change behavior around her. Most become docile and amicable themselves, and will want to stick around her for as long as possible. She has often been spotted with hounds or smilers by her side, who seem to have been completely soothed by her presence. Most entities who are near Philia will avoid attacking human beings, too. Furthermore, Philia has explained that she is incapable of feeling any form of resent resentment, since she, quote, exists with only goodness in mind, end quote, in her own words. She prefers to give second chances to anyone who deserves them, and generally avoids or tries to prevent conflicts and arguments. She claims she is very anxious regarding arguments happening around her. Philia is also a self-proclaimed pacifist and vegetarian. Despite her not needing any food, whenever she's seen eating, she always makes sure not to consume meat. Philia often brings gifts to people she likes, and said gifts always fit the preferences of the receiver. Many reported being gifted dresses, jewels, handmade objects, or baked goods that Philia personally creates. She also describes herself as a dreamer, who is often lost in her thoughts particularly romantic ones. Gallery. Show gallery. Image caption. A sketch of Philia drawn by her friend Kushim. The drawing is around a few decades old. Image caption. A depiction of Philia found in the Hall of Murals in level 57. Image caption. A digital drawing of Philia made by her friend Lorenzo. Image caption, a drawing of Philia made by a wanderer under the alias of Waffle. Image caption, a drawing of Philia made by a wanderer under the alias of Scutoid. Relations. Philia is confirmed to have relations with most, if not all, beings speculated to have some form of association with the Lost's pantheon. Whenever she is questioned about it, she describes all of them as her greatest companions and friends. She is still seen spending time with most of them in the present day. Olivia. Note. See the enigmatic level Tornasol. Quote. My fair knight and friend. She has been by my side for a shorter time than the others, yet she's still so dear to me. She's determined and protective. I just wish I could have saved her earlier than I did. End quote. Val. Note. See Person of Interest Val. Quote. 
Their music is the best. They're a good-hearted person, and I'm glad they found a true friend within Olivia. I did good by sending her to check on them when they first became an avatar. I'm proud of how far they've come. End quote. Fingare. Fingare. Quote. Fingare. I truly miss them. I only want them to finally be happy. End quote. Keymaster. Quote. Ah, uh, he's a very adorable one. He's a bit of a quiet bookworm, and he's very nice to be around. I try my best to hang out with him as much as I can, even if the version of him I know and cherished is gone. He is still someone I care about, with or without those memories. End quote. Kushim. Note. See related tales at the end of article. Quote. A man who has made many mistakes, and yet I've chosen to give him the chance to redeem himself. He was never a bad man, but he was carried away with his grief. It led him to give up everything and run away from the disaster he created. I do not resent him. Instead, I wish he can be happy. End quote. Yiliad. Note. See the level. Upsilon's domain. Quote, like Kushim, he has made many mistakes in his past. He had nobody to guide him and help him, and he was desperate to be worthy. Now he's married to Olivia, and they are happy. He has finally atoned for his sins. He made an oath to protect all human beings, and I am glad he found his true purpose. End quote. Vincent. Note, sea level 979. Quote, I've heard he has a friend that he can rely on at all times. I have never spoken with him yet, but I know he's a good man who went through a lot. I'm glad he has found happiness regardless. Blanche. Quote, Lady Blanche, she is the one I admire the most, being both refined and kind. She's one of my greatest friends, and I often go visit her. We often have tea parties together. End quote. Kirai, quote, my best friend Kirai. He may look intimidating or sound mean, but he is a total sweetheart. He really cares about me and truly tries his best to help. He's not a bad person, and I wish people did not judge him so badly. End quote. Pillar scribe, quote, poor soul, he has suffered so much. I wish I could help him properly, but I never get to see him. He is kept away from most of us. End quote. Divas. Quote. I've been helping him with rehab and things are going pretty well. A needs help and shouldn't be ashamed to ask for it. Don't worry. I'll be by air side no matter what. End quote. Alchemist. Quote. His knowledge and intelligence are so impressive. I truly admire him and appreciate him for being so patient with Fingare. He's a good mentor and a friend to them, although sometimes I think he finds me too sweet and clingy. End quote. Dark Sovereign. Quote. He is a strong figure and a good leader. Sometimes I feel like he's quite lonely, so I try to find an excuse to hang out and try and help him in his tasks. End quote. Red Knight. Quote. Claudius, you've always protected me and took care of me. I wish I could return all the favors you've done for me. I often feel like I should have done more for you. End quote. Argos. Quote. Shh, don't tell him, but he's an absolutely cute guy. I like his tough exterior and cold mannerisms. Deep down, he's a sweetheart that tries his best to slow down and learn how to treat others kindly. I've been helping him as a Patreon and member of the Sons of Guilt since forever. Note, see the eyes of Argos. Game Master. Quote, she's definitely a bit scary, but I feel pity for her. I do not know her well, but I wish to talk to her and try to understand her. End quote. Puzzle Maker. Quote, he's like a son to me. As soon as I knew of his existence, I took him under my wing. He's happy now. We are a family. I really cherish him dearly and hope I can protect him properly. End quote. Wide. 
link to related tale, love and grief, unconditional love, devotion until the end of time, love and grief. We were once again reunited in that place of mourning, both of us here for different purposes, yet being by your side felt reassuring, and I hoped you also felt some sort of relief during that harsh talk of yours. The quiet and gloomy graveyard created no noise on its own as I listened to the sound of your shovel digging in the ground. The sound I grew to recognize as familiar. We were alone as usual, surrounded by peaceful nothing, with only the resting spots of millions keeping us company. You were struggling, and I saw your expression shift, regretful, perhaps full of guilt, sweat, or tears dripped from your face. I did not know, and I shall never know. I hastened to reach out, perhaps to offer help or reassurance. I did not desire to stop you from your task, so I simply muttered some soft words in hope they'd be of any meaning to you, anything from a kind, encouraging phrase to something more heartfelt, something more close. Somehow, I felt like it helped, since you resumed digging with a less tired pace. Once again, you told me that I should close my eyes, perhaps to try and protect me still from the unstoppable force that is death. Yet, I reassured you that I would be fine. I've seen many die already, for that is part of the course of life and love. With your gentle but strong arms, you lift a small elderly human from the cold floor, they are so small in comparison to the tree next to the grave, so small and frail in death. That man died alone. I've seen him. Those he loved were not there for him in death. He died thinking everyone forgot about him after so many years. Loneliness. Loneliness is terrifying. Knowing that in death, nobody will be there for you at your grave. Nobody will ever even notice you're gone. You will just disappear like dust. The world will continue moving, and the people in it would not even know you exist. That is what loneliness is, and experiencing it in such a vulnerable moment is torture. I was not able to do anything to relieve that pain. When you placed the human in the comfortable deathbed, you began quietly mourning out of respect. I sat close to you and softly muttered blessings until I was ready to let go. It was time to let the dead return to the ground, to become one with it once more. That man was covered with dirt, now one with the soil. We drifted our gaze to the graves of our old friends who had died millennia ago. Well, we are still here, but at what cost? The mortals have lost their trust in us. They see us as incapable, cruel beings who failed them. They despise us, and they have grown without needing us. I ended up saying something out loud. If one day, you would eventually bury me in this place too, perhaps then, I will vanish from being forgotten completely. You didn't reply at first, but I knew what your answer was. That one day, you and I will join the others in these graves. Not even immortality could stop that inevitable end, and it scared me. I realized in that moment how badly I didn't want to die having been forgotten. I didn't want to die at all, not if I couldn't fulfill the reason I lived for. Yet, there is nothing I could have done, not even now. We stood there, mourning for what felt like minutes. I gently caressed the statues that depicted our old friends. Augustus, Claudius, the gatekeeper, each and every one of them. I thought of how my statue would look, how large the hole in the ground would need to be to fit my cold corpse. You would need to carry me here, cover me with dirt. I could not handle all of that. I did not want you to bury those you once called companions any further. You seemed ready to leave. I held you tightly in an embrace, and we stayed quiet for a few minutes, both of us not saying a single word. I tried to say something but the few words I could muster were not audible enough. You smelled like dirt, or, as I like to describe it, dirt and nothing, but also many things. 
That smell was memorized in my mind, like a familiar scent. Your black hair was slightly touching my face. I closed my eyes and embraced the warmth. I did not remember how we grew so close. You were very isolated from us in the past. Your ideals were always so much different than mine, yet you always tried to do what you believed was best for mortals, even if it ended up not the way you expected, even if it caused you pain. You've made your share of mistakes, like the rest of us, yet I've forgiven you. There is no point in drowning in anger and misery. In the end, something like this was inevitable, and it was just a matter of time before mortals outgrew us. Despite your misdeeds, you were trying to make amends, and I was there for you, and I will always be there for you. In the end, we are in the same sinking boat together, and I promised I wouldn't leave you behind, even after knowing the truth. The others did not take it so well. I remember you and Gudang were about to kill each other. I was terrified, and I had no choice but to unleash my weapon and put you both into a daze. I understood her, though. She loved mortals dearly. She depended on their attraction and interest towards her. What could she even do without her purpose? What could we do to face that loss? There was once a time where each of us were united. Yes, when the pantheon that mortals revered was more than just a sad, distant, and painful memory. I remember each one of you rather fondly, my friends. Kushim, you were always a mystery to me, yet I always enjoyed your company. Back then, you were rather reserved, yet I found you fascinating. Perhaps it was that human part of you, alongside your godhood, that made me so curious about you. You belonged to two worlds, one of which I could never see from your perspective. Perhaps that is why, in the end, you chose to do everything in your power to give them independence. Your motives were noble, but everything crumbled in the end. Now I see you in a different light. You are ridden with guilt, trying to atone for your sins. You cannot do this alone, not with the knowledge you have. I desire to lead you to a better path. Of course, you'll be the one to walk through it in the end, and I will accompany you. If there is one thing that has never changed, it's my care for you, Kushim. I will always care about you, regardless of the past. Then Gudang, my dear friend, you were strange in some ways to me, yet I've always admired your beauty and your creativity. In the end, you were as scared as I was to lose everything that one exists for. I knew that fear all too well. I do not know where you are now. You never came back, just like Augustus and Claudius. And my heart aches each time it remembers all of you are gone in some way. Even if my heart knows it, my mind pretends to be ignorant, to believe everything is as fine as it was eons ago. Otherwise, I may break, and my body may collapse from this overwhelming grief because I'll have to come to terms with the fact that most of you are dead or changed. Gatekeeper, I still feel your aura, yet it is so different now. You too have changed. You no longer remember, and the pain that causes me is like a knife in my chest. All of our memories have become nothing more than fleeting dust. Perhaps this is a punishment, a retribution for all of our ignorance and sin. When will you return to me? I miss you. I miss all of you. Iliad, we never were friends. Your purpose made it impossible for us to be close. Yet, I always tried to be by your side when nobody was there for you. You have committed horrendous acts because you were in despair, caused by this powerful purpose that controlled your life and tormented you so. And you returned after so long. Now you wander without purpose all throughout this broken realm. What will you do now that there is nothing left? But I do not wish for you to continue suffering. I myself cannot help you find the end of your endless self-torment, but I do know of a hope that may be able to fulfill this wish. 
It is only a matter of time. Perhaps fate will arrange a meeting between you two soon. And when the day comes, I hope you will find happiness and cleanse your heart of those sins you've committed with the help of someone else. And you, Lady Blanche, you have achieved something I've lost. You are able to be close to mortals, even if you need to conceal your nature in the process. I could also do the same, but I do not wish to pretend to be something I'm not. I wish to be close to mortals as a god, yet that may never again be possible. At the very least, you are still here, my dear friend. Even if we cannot see each other often, your kind words are one of the few cherished things I have left. As for me, mortals are the one thing I cherish the most, because I've seen the beauty and the love they feel. That beautiful and incomprehensible emotion, which is so special to them. From love, life is born. Love creates warmth, kindness, and acceptance. I wished to be able to always protect this emotion, to observe the way humans perceived it always. But now, my presence is unneeded, and deep within me, there's the fear of even being hated because of my godhood. I have no role left in guarding and observing this beautiful phenomenon. It scares me, being unable to return to what I saw as familiarity. After years of being by their side, of watching many grow, and some pass away, as if they were my closest friends. Time marches on, and I have somewhat accepted how things are now. In the end, only a few of us are left here, and I have come to terms with the fact that I must continue, even with many uncertainties, to find peace within me, or perhaps even happiness. I must first find the strength to accept my fate once again. I will do everything in my power to prevent others from suffering the same way I did. Perhaps, Olivia, that may be why on that fateful day I made you a part of me, reawakening the power of love within you. I saw myself. You have lost so much and fought so hard. You dragged the pieces of your broken heart back into place. Despite the grief you've experienced, I could not let everything you believed in fracture to pieces. It is not my place to decide what you must do now. To forge a new path, there will be many hardships you may need to face. You did not deserve to end in that miserable way. I am sorry I could not do anything more, but I will assist you however I can. That is a promise. There is a future where you and I will meet, and I will be waiting patiently for such a thing to happen. In the meantime, I too shall search for a new purpose, no matter how difficult it may seem. I will believe in a future for myself, as well as for the others, or perhaps we can still live, even without the one thing that we always existed for. And I made that promise to you too, Kushim, and to all of you who have passed. Until the end, I will hope, as if I was still that young god back then that liked to make wishes, looking at the stars and thinking of the future. Tonight, the stars seem bright again. Don't they, Kushim? Link to follow-up tale. The Alchemist and Philia. Unconditional love. Devotion until the end of time. The Alchemist. It was a peaceful day in level one, around two hundred years ago. Philia, the avatar of love, note, see Phenomenon 10, have been notified of the existence of a new avatar of comprehension to replace the previous. Note, see the all-seer. Enthusiastic to meet someone else like her, she immediately set off to meet him. She wondered what he'd look like, how he'd act, what kind of things he would like. She even considered going back to make him a gift, but decided against it. No time to waste, after all. There was no turning back now, she could sense him just around the corner. The goddess quietly looked around for the mysterious avatar, only to stumble upon him as he was frantically trying to collect his bearings. Oh my gosh, you're a faceling? That's awesome. I've never seen someone else like you before. It's so nice to meet you. She was bursting with happy energy, analyzing him with her pink eyes. 
Yes, yes, pleased to meet you, but who do you think you're talking to? Faceling. I must say, I'm not familiar with the term like that. He had a happy nonchalance to him, but he was clearly confused by her demeanor. He'd never met anyone else before, but he thought that this was certainly a peculiar first greeting. Oh, a faceling is a faceless entity. Usually they can't communicate verbally at all, but you can. Isn't that amazing? You're very similar to how I imagined you. I knew I was right. She examined his glasses from a distance, wondering what kind of power they held. They were gilded, just like the rest of him. Silly me, forgetting to introduce myself. I'm Philia, the goddess of love. You must be the god of comprehension, and diversion of the... N never mind. She quickly grew embarrassed and took a few breaths to compose herself. A version of the... Don't worry about it, you're new. You need to get to grips with life before we get into silly things like that. <laughs> Philia carried herself in such a light and breezy manner that the alchemist was compelled not to question her further and kill the mood. Still, he kept his curiosity in his back pocket. He'd look into her later. I suppose that's right. I'd introduce myself, but I don't have a name. Call me the alchemist. She pretended to be surprised in an attempt not to worry him. She didn't want to look weird or odd. She'd come clean sometime, just not yet. No name? Well, the alchemist works just fine. Why don't I show you around? You need a place to stay after all. There are so many things I can teach you. I can't wait. Some pink hearts started floating around her. Bottling her happiness clearly didn't work. It's pretty visible. I suppose I do need somewhere to stay, but don't try anything funny. I'm not quite sure what's going on yet, but I'm going to figure it out. That goes for everything, even you, Philia. It would have been an intimidating statement from somebody else, but he was new to this realm. Besides, she knew him very well. Note, see the article on the alchemist. Why wouldn't she trust him? Dear Alchemist, this is a letter for you, to remind you just how much I cherish you. You and your all-seeing glasses always had something new to show me. I remember that time you engineered me a perfume that was so tailored to me that all these years later I still wear it, not to mention the pages and pages of notes that came with it. You should take more pride in your writing. It kept me hooked all day, after I figured out your handwriting, that is. I miss how enthusiastic you used to be about your research, but I suppose I should have expected us to grow jaded over time. I was quite lo lonely in that period, but your presence filled a void in my heart. You let me stick around you and watch your brilliant mind at work. I won't stop thanking you for that. Never. You'll always, you always understood me more than I could ever understand myself. Without you, I don't think I would be the Philia I am right now. I wonder if you remember the first time I presented Fingare to you. It was convincing, you know who, but with a bit of luck, we managed. Remember how their eyes lit up, seeing the books and the papers you owned? It was absolutely adorable. Fingare was never much of an extrovert, but you took the time to suit their needs and their shyness. You are the only one who tried learning sign language for them. You have a heart of gold, my dear alchemist quite literally. Mentoring them was the best thing you could do for them. They could finally find some happiness, despite their isolation. My poor Fingare. I miss them. I miss them as much as you do. I know things aren't the same. How could they be? Without Fingare by our side, everything is darker. I will be strong for their sake, and I know you too will also find strength in this sea of nothing. We will get them out, I swore on it. Despite everything, you still stand by my side. No matter how much of a burden I feel like, you do not consider me such. Learning how to love myself is difficult, but you make it a better experience. Your silly antics and your disguised attempts to check on me are proof enough of that. You may be quite odd, but so am I. My fondest memory with you was when you showed me how to create a potion that would create pink heart-shaped clouds. It was lovely. Believe me, I've kept the little bottle as a memory of it. If we ever make potions together in the future, I promise not to burn everything like I almost did that time. I am not so clumsy anymore, Pinky promise. My dear alchemist, 
I hope you appreciate that you and I are closer than I am to most. The day you figured out my biggest secret. Note, see the article on the enigmatic entity, The Pillars. I was worried you'd freak out, but you just had a million questions to ask about. I trusted you with the truth back then in a heartbeat, and I'd do it again. Would you do that too? Discovering you here, again. I hope we can be friends with you, everywhere. Just like this. I wish I could do it all over again, to be honest. To return to how things were. Maybe then, we could always be happy. I wonder if you feel the same way sometimes. But, I guess you'd be more focused on the future. You can't change the past, Philia. So what's the point of blaming yourself? She always used to say that. You're so alike. Even if you don't see it that way. I guess I still have some guilt about what happened, but you've given me another chance. I think you're right about the past and the future. I should focus on the version of you that exists here and now. Maybe then we'll all survive. Even with our scars, we will never be forgotten. For all seers' sake, for Fingare's, for the sake of all those who loved me, I hope this time I can be a good friend. For as long as you wish to keep me around, I will follow after you with a smile, the same smile you gave me when we are together. I would plead with you never to drop it. One day, when everything is over, we three will sit by a calm tree and read a nice book like we all used to. All of us. Until then, I can only dream. With love, Philia. See the article for a list of relevant tales and articles. Related tale, Como Oide and Philia, Unconditional Love, Devotion Until the End of Time, Como Oide, Our Meeting Occurred by Pure Chance, I Was the Second to Last in Form, The Others Were Already in Action When My Consciousness First Developed, And So I Wandered the Gloomy Void Before I Sensed You, My Dear Friend. You had a fluid appearance, not maintaining one form for long, but still distinctly a jester, a fitting choice for such a humorous pillar. I was curious, and so I approached you, and for the first time, we both saw each other. You are the last to have engraved, aren't you? Seems that it is just the two of us here. Not so lonely in the end, is it? My eyes were staring right at you as I was slowly making my way to your side, curiosity and innocence seeping into me at the sight of something new. Ah, uh, there is another here. How peculiar. I thought the rest had all left by now. What might you be? Your voice was a cacophony of noises, like a crowd whose members tried to talk as one. Laughter, cackles, and giggles, all united. I found it rather overwhelming at first, but quickly grew to see it as comforting and soothing. I am a mother's lullaby, the whisper of wind that caresses an infant's cheek. I am the fabric of the heartstrings, the silken tapestry interwoven in the spirits of kindred friends. I am the warmth of the lover's embrace, the gentle fire kindled by two souls entwined as their lips draw near in a rapturous kiss. I am Philagaf, I replied. And you? I am the laughter of the masses, the giggling of an infant, the reflection of their past. I am Komooide. Even as we spoke for that first time, I felt a connection. We were both young dismissed as servants of folly by our older kin who corresponded to bolder ideas and loftier philosophies. As we stood face to face, there was the tact acknowledgement of that shared rejection, and with it, the tact embrace of our shared simplicity. I understood then that the opinions of our elder companions mattered much less than I had first believed. The first meeting marked the beginning of our eternal friendship. There was not a single moment in which we were not together, where I was not laughing, where you were not loved, where we were not happy. You were there to protect me from the wrath of the one that once loved me so dearly, 
that ended up falling into despair, my beloved Fingarai. You were there to play with me as we ran and laughed like two carefree children, and I was there to give you all the affection in the world, to wipe away any tears and to mend any wound of yours. You always beat me at any game, yet I did not mind. In fact, it made me so happy seeing you proud as you cheerfully twirled around. What a jokester. What a tease you were. You truly enjoyed toying around with me in that playful way of yours, and I enjoyed every moment of it, returning your jokes with mine. I came to know every single part of your whole being, the way your tone would change depending on your mood. We were so close that I felt my heart tangled with yours, beating in unison, as if they were one thing. Do you remember, Como, the day you found the orphan huddled against the wall, crying from his solitude? You called for me, as you weren't experienced in calming children. I comforted him, grew him a rose which he held in his palms as the tears continued to flow down his cheeks. We brought him to a calmer place, a field similar to his original home. You changed your form, taking the shape of a tiny squid so as to comfort him. After all, he had come from a fishing village. That much we understood. Then he lifted his palms to you, offering you the rose which I had given him. You found, then, resting gently in its center, a pearl fresh from the sea, perfectly round, bright, and pure. It was then that you took him into your embrace and made him your child, your avatar. And do you remember when he asked often, in those first days, if he would be lonely? You promised that he would never be alone again, that he finally had a family. Truth be told, I hardly understood the idea of an avatar at the time. I could hardly fathom what it meant for a god to make a mortal their own, to cherish them so dearly. I have never found one so dear to me, so holy for myself. But seeing the way you held that young boy in your tendrils as you hummed your gentle lullaby, I yearned to care for something so fragile, to hold in my arms a child of my own. From that day onwards, the tendrils around your head were adorned with pearls. Your avatar often gifted them to you as a token of gratitude ever since. That day he first gifted you some. I could feel the love you had for him, like a parent's love for their child. It was a warm feeling. I, too, grew a soft spot for that young child and loved him dearly. He used to cling to my leg and run on the soft grass. He used to smile so brightly and bring me flowers. Nunca, my sweet Nunca. Nunca was always so cheerful and joyous. You taught him everything like a parent would. He was a part of you, almost your own flesh, and I would feel the pure aura of parental love surround you. It felt nice and always smelled like sweet flowers. As Philia, I watched over him, helping you raise him like a family would. He started having many hopes and dreams, many wishes and expectations. The more he grew, the more our love towards this silly child grew, and the closer we became. I stood and watched as he performed for the first time, making sure the magic behind him could captivate the looks of others, making sure he was illuminated and looked at. I made sure his colorful clothes were always ready to be worn as he went around showing them to others. I was like his mother, and he was like my son, and I stood and watched as he grew. I stood and watched as I helped him forward from the well-hidden background. He was like an infant taking his first steps. I was there to lift him up if he ever were to fall, but he did not usually need it. He was able to walk on his own. He was able to continue on his own path. Many centuries passed since he became an avatar, and Nunca had grown into a fearsome yet respectable and trustworthy avatar. He spread laughter through villages, 
bringing smiles to the faces of the young and old. Even if his attire made him look like an easy target to cruel people, he gained respect with his skillful dodging and unpredictable strategies. I still remember the day he defeated an opponent with a boot and a snake, and he would proudly show off his skills as he played with the other children. He would speak of me and you. He would speak of the mystical things he could do, of all the great hopes and dreams he had, and I stood and watched with a smile. I stood and watched. He went out on his own. He brought us gifts and treats, and would always wish to stay by our side, and I remembered where I needed to be, observing the course of our peaceful existence without being too much of an interference. And he grew and grew, little by little. We marked how tall he got every few months on the tree nearby the village. The lines started so low, and then the lines were cursed to stop halfway through, and I stood and watched as it happened. I blame myself on the day that everything spiraled came. Even today I question myself. If I had moved, if I had walked, if I did not stand and watch. That day I felt your immense love and joy turn into pure despair. I remember that day, the day when all laughs went silent. You had shown your true self to Nunca when he asked to see you. I was there and didn't know what would happen. He laid in your arms with blank eyes and no breath. You screamed for him to wake up, that it couldn't end now, despite knowing that his fate was sealed. I will never forget the expression of dear Nunca. A wide grin of laughter plastered across his lifeless face. I heard the laughter before the upcoming death. It was like an insane cackle. Just glancing at his oversoul made his mind melt into nothing. It couldn't even be restored. Even in the present, the laughter never abandons my nightmares. Nunca will haunt me forever as a permanent reminder of the guilt I feel. And all I did during his dying moments was stand there. I stood and watched as his mind melted into nothing. I stood and watched as his body went limp. I stood and watched. Why did I not move? I was afraid. I was afraid, and I did not know what to do. I was too pathetic, and I could only exist in the back as I saw an invisible prop. I felt insignificant, and I still feel this way. Only after a while, only after it was all useless, I moved. The expression of pure grief and horror on your face terrified me. It was as if you were falling apart, and I couldn't do anything. You were losing yourself, and I desperately wanted to save you. So I reached out and held your cheeks, trying to wipe away your tears of sorrow. Como, please, Como, I whispered. All you could spew out were the words of suffering and blame towards yourself. I held you close and tried to comfort you, to help you regain even a bit of a grasp over yourself. It was the only thing I could do. I was so powerless. Seeing this gave me so much pain, yet I could not cry. No matter how much suffering it caused me, I could not shed any tears or I'd fall apart because of this cursed inability to process pain. And so I remained embracing you in your grief. None of us had the strength to move or get up in that moment. You refused to let go of Nunca until you were too exhausted to even cry. At that point, something broke in you, and you let him be taken away, and I let it happen in silence. With the help of the others, Nunca was buried alongside the rest of his fallen companions that were part of our group. I stood and watched as his mind melted into nothing. I stood and watched as his body went limp. I stood and watched. Why did I not move? I was afraid. I was afraid, and I did not know what to do. I was too pathetic, and I could only exist in the back as I saw an invisible prop. I felt insignificant, and I still feel this way. Only after a while, only after it was all useless, 
I moved. The expression of pure grief and horror on your face terrified me. It was as if you were falling apart, and I couldn't do anything. You were losing yourself, and I desperately wanted to save you. So I reached out and held your cheeks, trying to wipe away your tears of sorrow. Como, please, Como, I whispered. All you could spew out were the words of suffering and blame towards yourself. I held you close and tried to comfort you, to help you regain even a bit of a grasp over yourself. It was the only thing I could do. I was so powerless. Seeing this gave me so much pain, yet I could not cry. No matter how much suffering it caused me, I could not shed any tears or I'd fall apart because of this cursed inability to process pain. And so I remained, embracing you in your grief. None of us had the strength to move or get up in that moment. You refused to let go of Nunca until you were too exhausted to even cry. At that point, something broke in you, and you let him be taken away, and I let it happen in silence. With the help of the others, Nunca was buried, alongside the rest of his fallen companions that were part of our group. He was given a special gravestone, embedded with the same type of pearl he had given you so long ago, right above his name, and I remained still as his small body was buried underneath the soil, as his little hand was covered forever. That night was the last night I would see you before you left for centuries. Your whereabouts became unknown to the rest of the pillars. The humor amongst mortals turned vile, used as a weapon to insult the vulnerable. Wicked laughter hurt the anxious. Their loving chuckles rotted into horrible cackles. Your departure left a gaping void within me. I could not handle you losing you and Nunca, both in the span of mere days. I didn't know, and I still don't know. It was time I put my mind and body to rest, so that I would not need to think of the pain any longer, and so I could still fulfill my duty without being a nuisance. My memories lingered on your smile, in your sweet words, and I felt my heart beginning to tear apart, slowly, yet I was too tired to move, too tired. I would not be standing and watching anymore. I would move and I would disappear, because I could do nothing in my life except cause pain. I imagined I was in your embrace as I slowly grew to accept my looming status. Como oaid. I thought of the one I loved and lost. The second one I also loved that hurt us all and vanished. And then, of my dear Nunca, I drowned deeper in my regrets, like thorns of crimson roses digging into my flesh. I believed I would remain in this void forever. But then I felt something grasping my hand and pulling me back to the surface. I saw you there, and I couldn't describe your expression. It was a mix of many things, including panic and fear, but most importantly, pain. You, you scolded me. You scolded me and cried and begged me not to ever do this again. In that moment, I saw how helpless and vulnerable you were reduced to be, how scared you were about the possibility that I could have vanished. At the time, I was unable to say anything, yet I wanted to cry and yell your name. I held you close, not knowing if it was your real form, but not caring either. I said your name again with a shaky voice, and I cried for the second time in my life. I cried so much that I choked on my own tears, begging for you to stay and not leave me again. I needed you. I always did. I loved you, como I'd. I love you, my dear friend. I swear... Swear you'll never disappear like that again. I thought, with barely any strength. I couldn't speak, yet you lifted me up gently and wrapped something warm around my shoulders before you carried me away. I couldn't listen to what you said. I had no strength for that. I just knew you were there, and my heart felt less heavy in that moment. We spoke about many things once I rested. Your regrets and my pain.
loss, forgiveness, and guilt. That guilt that ate you up whole. He believed it was all your fault, yet I reassured you otherwise. You, my dear Komo Oaid, suffered long enough. We both looked at the sky with nostalgia. We stayed silent for a long time, and that was okay. That was okay because we were together, so it didn't matter if we didn't speak. And then you decided you had work to do. You would depart and right your wrongs. You would dress your wounds and the wounds of those you had hurt in your bitterness. You would chase the wind, chase the sun, relearn the songs of light and air and truth and find it in you to laugh, joyfully, innocently, genuinely, once more, and then, only then, we would see each other again, and then we would speak again, and then we would be together again forevermore. You and I promised that day to right all the wrongs of our existence, to never drown in our sorrows ever again. And so I wait. I wait for you to right your wrongs, to pry the thorns of grief from your wounds, to let them heal into scars, to laugh once more. The road ahead is harsh and cold, like a stormy winter, but everyone knows that after the harsh winter, there is spring and the sun shining up in the sky. Even if it takes a long time, if we walk together, the cold weather won't be as hard to handle. The first flowers of spring are already blooming. <laughs>